Welcome to this episode of the Greater Phoenix Chambers podcast, Let's Talk Business Phoenix, with me, your host, Todd Sanders, President and CEO of the Greater Phoenix Chamber. In each episode, we tackle important issues and subjects affecting our businesses, our community, and the state today. Through relevant, timely topics, this podcast serves as the business community's voice with the mission of championing business growth, identifying problems that restrict economic development, and conveying community leaders to move Phoenix forward. Let's Talk Business Phoenix was produced in partnership with Ideas Collide, an agency offering a full suite of custom marketing solutions for your brand's unique challenges. Make a connection at ideascollide.com. Well, welcome back to the podcast. We are really excited today to have Derek Hall, the president and CEO of our Arizona Diamondbacks with us. Derek, thanks for taking the time. Todd, it's good to be here. Good to see you, my friend. It's awesome to see you. How are you? Uh, you obviously have some formula where you don't age, which is good, yeah, I right. guess. That's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, well, obviously, I think 99% of the people here know you, but maybe talk a little bit about yourself and then something that we wouldn't know about you. It's not on your bio, for instance. Sure. Yeah. So I've been in baseball now over 30 years. Hard to believe. I yeah. always wanted to be in baseball. I was actually going to go to West Point. Um, I had had the senatorial appointment. I was going to West Point at the last minute. I I panicked and I went to Arizona <laughs> State University. So I'm Good from, move. Yeah, yeah, I came here, went to the went to ASU. My dad at the time was so upset that I was doing that rather than go to West Point. He said, well, then you're on your own. I said, okay. And Several years later, he said, okay, I know why you went there. It was to meet your wife, Amy, who I've been with then. for, yeah, over <laughs> it. And we've been married, you know, 32 years. We've been together 36 years. We have mm-hmm. three kids, adult kids, 28-year-old, who's uh, an anchor, morning anchor in, in L.A., um, and a reporter, a middle guy who started a company, Educational Technology. He moved it to Salt Lake. And then our daughter, who uh, just graduated from Emory University, nice. where she played soccer, she's out here and she's actually working for us, which is a lot of fun. In the family business. In the family business, exactly. So I, I left uh, school, went to uh, grad school in Ohio, mm. got my master's in sports administration, went off to work for the Dodgers for several years before getting here. And I couldn't wait to get here. You I upgraded. Wanted to get, a total upgrade. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine every time I went to Chase Field or Bank One back then, I kept thinking, how do I get back in this market? How do I get back to this city that I love so much, my home? And so we did. And and what is something unique about me? Uh, you know, I, I love animals. I love dogs. And I've got, uh, they were raised during the pandemic, but I've got two female labs right now who I nice. just love, Ivy and Maisie. And they are my world right now. Yeah. yeah. And grandkids yet? No grandkids yet. Okay. Right. My, my son was uh, engaged. He's now very serious uh, relationship again. Nice. So we'll see. I think okay. they're getting there, but no, you know, no rush. In the, batter's, okay. in the batter's box. Yeah, right. All right. Awesome. Well, I'm thinking about so 10 years ago, we were opening up in Australia. I think it was 10 years. That's like, right. That didn't go month. so well. Well, it, it didn't. But, <laughs> you know, what I was thinking about that from that time, you know, 10 years, think about how much has changed. Yeah. Uh, a very wise man once told me, if you look in the rearview mirror of your life, all you see is change. Talk to us about this last 10 years. It's been incredible. I mean, as a, as a sport and as an industry and then as an organization. I mean, I look at our sport and, and what we've done the last couple of years, we have transformed it. I was worried about the popularity of our sport. You know, I heard several years ago, it was good, Todd. Someone said, if you went back 75 years and you asked anybody what the most popular sports in the world were, in no particular order, they would have said horse racing, boxing, and Major League Baseball. Today you ask and they say NFL, Major League Baseball, NBA. It's up to us to make sure 75 years from now, MLB is still in those top three. And it didn't look like we were going to be. I mean, we were losing popularity, losing fans. We had to strike several times, work stoppages. And then you think pandemic, we're playing baseball in front of cardboard cutouts, right? There's there's no baseball yeah. really. And then we had smaller crowds, we had limited crowds, we had we had uh, shorter seasons, and then it all changed. The lap before last year, you talk about change. We had the World Baseball Classic, which you saw it, of yeah. course, downtown. The people were amazing. In jerseys, Mexico and yep. USA and Canada, and we had sellout crowds and energy and noise and music. It was unreal. But we also had, for the first time, really like no constraints, no restrictions. Crowds were back to normal. Fans were excited about the rules changes. They thought they were going to be okay. And then they loved them and fell in love with them. And they worked for us. Were you nervous? I was very nervous. Yeah. And, and because the, the players weren't even sure, like, are these going to no. work? And then they yeah. realized... We had a team that was built for those, right? A very energetic, (laughs) active, fast, you know, base running team. And so that all worked. But then I I look at our organization and what we've done. We have grown 
you know, we recommitted ourselves to a farm system and building from within. We've always been so good with fan experience and taking care of our mm -hmm. fans. I think we're the best in the game. We have a top culture, you know, when it comes to the industry and, and we are a place people want to work and, and a company people want to work for. So I've seen a lot of great change, um, the impact we've made on the community and then just the growth and, and the local leaders, business leaders, civic leaders like yourself. And what you've done to cultivate from small business to, you know, enterprise. And, and I couldn't be prouder of the growth that I've seen downtown, but yeah. but throughout all of Arizona. It has been astounding. And you're right. Just that in that 10 year period, so much has changed. Yeah. So I think for people who obviously know your title, but what does it look like to be Derek Hall? What does it what, what, what does it mean to be the, the president and CEO of such an incredible organization that obviously we're the World Series twice now? Yeah, well, it means you don't sleep much and your, your, <laughs> your emotions go up and down with the wins and losses. But, um, you know, I've got really every department uh, that would that would report to me, including baseball and the business side. So it just depends on the on the day of the week. There's times where, you know, I'm more engaged with uh, leaders like yourself mm -hmm. or I'm working on government affairs or it's more PR communications related. It just depends what fire we have to put out or what, what we're doing marketing wise in the community. Um, but we've got 450 full-time employees and across the world, we've got about 2000. When you look at scouts and part-time, it's a, it's a large enterprise and a big business, but, um, you know, we've had a lot of employees that work for us from, from, from day one, they're entry level positions or they were interns and now they're VPs. So it's very family feel. So when you're a president and, and CEO of an organization where you really feel like everybody's on the same side of the rope. And, and I do, and they're really are, there's no silos and, and people don't work, you know, in their office with the door shut. It, it really is family and interaction and engagement. I couldn't be more proud. It's interesting when you walk around the organization, it's not sort of a this sort of a fear-based mentality. No. It feels like people, like they belong there and, yeah. and that they have a role. And, and you're right. And, and that's exactly right. And I think people know they have an opportunity. They do have a role, but they know that they can, they can make an impact. They know that they can give suggestions. They're going to be listened to. They're going to be, it's not I, it's always we. I encourage people to be innovative, be pioneering, make mistakes. It's okay to make a mistake. Learn from that mistake and don't make it again or improve upon it. Borrow an idea from another team, but don't just lift and shift it, make it even better. So that's really the environment and the culture there. And it's uh, it's been one that has worked and it's one that I think is starting to be duplicated. And I'm really proud of that. The other thing I've seen is just reaching across the aisle to the other teams mm -hmm. and, and how we're all working so well together now too. You know, and the Suns have new ownership. We're excited about them. We're doing a lot again with the Suns and my counterpart there is uh, Josh is doing such a great job. I'm proud of him. Um, we all have to mentor each other and help each other and make sure that all boats rise. Coyotes. Coyotes, yeah. I mean, you know, we need to make sure they they stay here. Yeah. I mean, this is a, a city, a community, a state that can definitely support the big sports. So if we were to to lose one, I think that would be that would be a ding. We don't want that because we we have the fans, we have the yeah. we have the land, we have the the right community, we have the support. We need the, the the coyotes to succeed. We need us to stay right where we are and the Cardinals to continue to flourish. As we talked about the Suns and Mercury, they're doing great. Absolutely. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. But sure. And maybe this is a little nuanced from the first question, which is, you know, tell us, what's your leadership style? I'm, I'm more of engagement, communication, transparency, vulnerability, total honesty, and open book. Uh, I've always got an open door as well. I, I feel like as a leader, people have to trust you. They have to, and, and trust is a big word. That's why I go back to transparency. I'm I'm open book with our, our organization. We have monthly meetings with the entire company. I have weekly meetings with my leadership team. And I think I, you know, it's at that time where I have to let them know what's happening behind the scenes, everything. Not, you know, so that they learn about it a month from now in the paper, but that they know everything because I trust them too. And what we all talk about stays there. Uh, I lean on them for emotional support, but also occupational support because I think there's so much capacity intellectually there. But my, my style has always been one of, of support, of friendliness, of encouragement, motivation, reward. That's very important to me too. I mean, recognition. Um, I'll never take the credit. I want others to, but I want to make sure that people feel promoted, rewarded, in, uh, invested in, developed. And that's what not only my leadership style, but now, and I don't want a bunch of Derek's out there, yeah. but I want to make sure that's also our culture too. Well, it seems like obviously you you are a pretty important person in, in our country when you think about sports, but what I get, the sense I get, and obviously I know a lot of your leadership team is that you sort of empower people and you're also not afraid for one of your folks to be out in front on something. Oh, I, it makes me more proud, right? right? And, and, and yeah, absolutely. Too many people want to, 
you know, they don't do a good job delegating or they just want to do it all themselves. And I, I'm not about that at all. Let someone else grow, let them get the recognition, let them promote themselves or go get another job elsewhere so we can be proud. And what we do find, we let them, you know, we'll, we'll clip the wings and let them go. <laughs> but we find that they want to come back and work for us again. So the grass is not always greener, but it says a lot when someone leaves and they can't wait to get back with you. That, that's, a, that's a big nod to their coworkers, the workplace that we've, uh, that we've created and that they've created because the culture is really created by the people. But let them get out in front. Let yeah. them get that experience. Let them get the recognition and the, and the accolades. So looking at it from the other perspective, from a, from a fan perspective, I think one of the first times I went to the stadium and you gave us a tour, one of the things you talked about was this, the idea that even if you have to say no, you have to find a way to say yes. That's it. How do you actually accomplish you that in a, in a business that's really customer Good memory, Todd, by the way. Yeah, that's a big part of who yeah. we are. That's a big part of, a, of our daily and game day experience is FOTSI. And that's find a way to say yes. And we have it on a button. And every game day staff member has that button that says FOTSI. And that's what we preach. So you're going to have to find a way to say Now, there's some departments like security where it's a yeah. little more difficult to say yes all the time. And there's also a there's an art in saying no, but it still sounds like yes because – we have to earn every single fan we can. There are some markets. You go to New York, Chicago, LA, big markets. Their marketing, all they have to do, Todd, is put their promotional schedule out or their schedule for the season and open the gates. Yeah. We have to earn every single fan. It's tough, you know, and we have hot summer months and you compete with, you know, uh, air conditioned malls or movie theaters or mm -hmm. the mountains or San yeah. Diego. People are leaving. And so we have to get them here, get them to the ballpark, get them in the in the habit of going to games and enjoying it and wanting to go back the next day. And so that's really been a big part of it. And and so you can't say no, you know, I mean, right. you can, but you really can't. Right. And, and for us, every fan matters. It's one fan at a time yeah. and it's access and communication and honesty and, and listening. One, I, one of my favorite stories related to that was the fan that wanted his seat to be a different color. Yes. So that, that's, that's a, that's a, that's an a emotional story. One. Yeah. Yes. His name was Bob and we were changing our uniforms back in 07. And that was the first time we were going from purple and teal to red to Sedona red and snow yep. and sand. And people were upset. Um, <laughs> and my wife was upset too, that we were doing it. And so Bob was one of them. And, and so, so Bob was, um, he was, at this meeting that we had with season ticket holders and we had them all around the table and I thought, okay, and they were pretty upset about the uniform change. So we invited them in. We used to have these meetings. We still do periodically where we'll talk about everything from game time starts okay. to the food, to the pricing. And we want feedback from all our, our fans. So Bob was there and he was upset about the uniforms. And I had former players come in like Matt Williams, Mark Grace come in wearing the uniforms. And I'm almost like a fashion show. I'm, so I'm saying, and, you know, here's Matt Williams wearing the Sedona red with the Sonoran sand. You see the <laughs> trim here on Mark Grace with red. And Bob stands up and said, oh, enough is enough. He said, I'm so tired of the Sedona red. Red is red. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way. And I said, I take it you don't like these jerseys. He said, no, I can't stand it. And I said, well, if we win the division this year, and I give you one. Will you wear it? He says, if you win the division. And he said, yeah, because we weren't, we were supposed to finish last. <laughs> well, we win the division. We have Bob come back. We give him the jersey. He actually wears it. We have a party celebration, the whole deal. We became very close. Yeah. And he got very sick. And he had a, he had a terminal uh, form of stomach, stomach cancer. And his wife called me one day um, from the hospital. He hadn't spoken in a week. And so, Todd, she says, um, Bob just woke up and he wants to talk to you. I get on the phone and he says, you know, I just had a dream. And I was flying over the stadium. He said, and I realized the roof is open, so I fly down a little closer. And I look down, and I see all the green seats, the ballpark green seats. He said, and I fly even closer, and I see there's one red seat. And he said, and as I get even closer, I realize that's my seat. And he said, and I just want you to know, when I pass, I want that red seat that was my green seat. And I want a plaque there that says my name and, quote, red is red. So I said, well, Bob, you're going to be around a long time. Yeah. Unfortunately, he wasn't. He passed quickly. And today we have one red seat awesome. with that plaque. Yeah. yeah it's a, I love that story. Yeah. I, mean, I think it speaks to the culture. Yeah. I, I've been told that you're a big fan of Disney and, and meaning that they're sort of the way that they um, manage what they do and the product that they sell. Are, are there some similarities? And do you take some of that and bring it in into your philosophy? I absolutely do. And I do go to Disney a lot. In fact, we have our employees of the month. They're called uh, Team Players of the Month. And they're actually part of our President's Council. And we take them on a trip once a year, usually Disney. And the thought is have a little fun, but also observe because that yeah. is the epitome when mm -hmm. it comes to customer service and cleanliness, which is a big part of our, our experience, yeah. right? Is 
cleanliness, customer service, pricing, um, you know, safety. And so we go there and I used to always tell the story and I would say, I want you to watch when someone drops popcorn, some, some little guy in all white is going to come over, sweep it up, be gone in no time. And so sure enough, <laughs> year after year, we'd go and I'd go, watch, and I'd drop a little popcorn and they'd come and do it. Well, I used to preach that to our facilities folks, like, listen, you know, do the Disney method. When someone drops popcorn, pick it up. And one day I'm in the office early and we have a, a day game because it's a Saturday game of the week. And I'm in my office looking out and it's all glass from floor to ceiling. I could look down on the concourse and it happens. And someone drops popcorn and out of nowhere, someone comes over and cleans it up. I went, oh my goodness. I go over to my laptop and I write real quick to my VP and my director of facilities. I said, it just happened. Someone dropped popcorn. They came over and swept it. And a few seconds later, they wrote back, yeah, we know we staged it. But still, they were thinking about it. But they were thinking about it. <laughs> At least you got the message across. That's right. right. <laughs> they got it. Well, it is an incredible organization. And you're right. That all that all happens in customer services, what that's all about, which is. is reflected in, in the work that you all do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that is Disney. I mean, you go to Disney yeah. and it's about making memories. That's what baseball is. We're mm -hmm. in the business of creating memories and we want it to be memorable. You're not going to win every game. We know that. And uh, when you're having a bad season, how does a family still leave with a smile on their face? Are the kids asleep over the shoulder, which is my favorite picture on the way out? And you can't wait for them to get back the next day or within a week or whatever it takes. Uh, one of my earliest memories was, um, I think it was in, it was maybe 2000. And we just just started the season and everyone started chanting, open the roof, which of course we don't do that anymore. <laughs> but, and so you open the roof. It was probably like the fifth or sixth inning. And then every being Phoenicians were like, it's cold. So we start closing close the roof. The roof. You, you close the roof. I, I, <laughs> I had a fan. This is so good. I had a fan. We had one of our haboobs, you know, yep. in the whirlwind and all that. And so, but the roof is open. It's, it's batting practice. And I went upstairs and I was going from like portal to portal to just before <laughs> the gate was open to tell all our game day staff, thank you. And give them a hug. Thank you for treating everybody. Well, well, the gate opens and the, now the clouds have turned and it's, you know, it's dark yeah. and it's, you know, and now the wind's picking up and I'm like, Oh boy, this is one of those. And here's hot dog wrappers flying around and I'm walking, like trying to close my eyes. And this guy goes, Mr. Hall. I said, yes, sir. He said, don't you think you should shut the roof? And I said, well, I said in Atlanta right now, it's humid or it's rainy. They're okay. I said, in Pittsburgh, it's rainy and humid. They're okay. And he said, yeah, but if they had a roof, don't you think they'd be smart enough to close it? <laughs> Good point. Get close, on the the roof. close the roof. <laughs> it is a nice luxury. It is. No, having a roof is great, especially here. And and even when there's talk of a new stadium, like if there's, do you need to build a new stadium? And if you do, should you have a roof? Well, you have to have yeah. a roof. I mean, you know, our, our game is played in the summer months. And so it's really nice to have that. And and I think that's also why the maintenance and, and the number of issues that we have that need to be addressed, it's because of that wear and tear in a stadium that's been there already 26 years. And we forget. I honestly, 20, uh, 2000 feels like just yesterday. Yeah. And, and you, you you do keep it beautiful. Thank so you. people forget that there's wear and tear. Thinking about a 26-year-old car would, wouldn't be a good situation. Right. So let's talk about that a little bit. Obviously, we, we're going to need to do something on that. What are, what are What's the thinking right now? Yeah, you know, we're having lots of conversations with county, city, state. Mm -hmm. We're county-owned. And if you could have gone back, say, 30 years ago when this thing was being negotiated, you would have tried to find and found, and it's nobody's fault, but you want to find – a pathway or a pipeline of revenue that could go back into the stadium. Perfect example, ASTA, you know, and the Cardinals, it yeah. just works so well. They've got, sure, they've got some taxes like um, rental car yes. and, and hotel tax, but the income tax from the players and the, and the staff and the sales tax, you know, it's recaptured, it goes back into ASTA, and then a portion of that goes back into the facility. So there's always upgrades because it's an asset and it's yes. owned by a government entity. Well, same with us. So ours is owned by the county, but they don't have the ability to really raise money to put back into their stadium. So we're trying to find what that public partner or public private partnership would look like where, you know, what can we do with the city? What can we do with the state and the county to make sure that we create some sort of a funnel to help out the stadium? which by the way, we don't own, yeah. the county owns. So it's not going in our pockets. Like all that money would go into improving the building, which would improve the fan experience, which would drive more revenues and more taxes. So uh, we're, we're, we're trying to figure that out right now, Todd. And, I, and we want to stay right there. Okay, that um, was the question. You want oh, to stay yeah, downtown. Yeah. We want to stay right there. We want to stay downtown. We want to stay at Chase. And we're willing to put anywhere from, you know, 200 to 400 million of our own money into it. We just want a little bit of partnership. And when you look around, um, there are teams right now like Milwaukee that, that are getting $500 million. The Texas Rangers just got $500 million for their ballpark. Over 300 in Cleveland and Baltimore's getting money and Pittsburgh's getting money. And those are not, you know, cities as as powerful and and, and productive as we are. So I, I think, and we're not asking for that, but there's got to be something that we can do that can help that building. 
and our fans can continue to you know be proud of their home and we can bring in new premium areas and do more kids areas and just we need to keep it as, as uh, modern and as state of the art as possible even this year we just put in a brand new sound system. We put in brand new sports lights, LED lights that are going to be great for the experience. Right. We're going to, as you mentioned, we're going to keep putting money into the stadium, but we need to do something much bigger because we've mm-hmm. hit that point where it's time for a change. We're one of the oldest buildings. It's hard to imagine. All the way, right? We're the fourth yeah. oldest in the National League. It's crazy. And yeah. you've got Wrigley and you've got Dodger Stadium. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So there's been a lot of talk about the number of seats. Uh, yeah. being reduced. What are some what are some of the things we might see I, in a stadium? Yeah, good question. And I don't think we'll ever do that. Okay. And, and there was, you know, a long time ago, people really focused on the number of seats okay. and, and is it too cavernous? Is it too big and not intimate enough? I say yes. If you were going to build it today, you probably want it to be 33 to 38,000, you know, seats total for capacity. We're at 50. But we don't want to change that because when you're there at opening day or when you're there for the playoffs like we just were and you look around and you say, thank goodness we have 50,000 seats, right? Because we packed that place. It was great. And home field advantage was unbelievable. For Elton John concert. Yeah, Yeah. for Elton John. (laughs) That was awesome. Bad Bunny was the largest (laughs) concert we ever had. You know, and it was huge. We had back-to-back nights of of a country concert that was Morgan Will and that was unbelievable. So that's when you're really happy you have that big capacity. There's other things we need to do and we need to fix a a lot of infrastructure first. which people don't it. see. Yeah, we got to fix the uh, fix the HVAC to make sure it stays cool uh, in that building. We've got to fix a lot of the pipes and where we've had leaks throughout the building. We want to redo a lot of the seats, uh, make them larger and more comfortable. Redo mm. some of the suites and, and add more club areas. If you go to a new ballpark today, you'd be amazed at how different it is from ours. Yeah, and and they are now generating revenue. Not to mention outside and around the, the the ballpark as well. You want 365 days a year. You want activation. You want mm-hmm. restaurants and retail and hotel. And we need to do that. The Atlanta Braves mm-hmm. almost tripled their mm-hmm. revenue because they built the battery outside. It's called the battery, which is retail and hotel and, and business and restaurants outside of their ballpark. And they are just crushing it. That's what we're all hoping to do. Even if you have like a ballpark village, where it's a nice restaurant, bars, you know, you have to have that. And and we've done great for the businesses around. I look back to our playoffs this year and the numbers were, they were amazing. I think it was of our crowd, of our sellout crowds, like 10% of those large crowds went to a restaurant or bar before the game and 16% went after the game. So think about that spilling out and spilling in. Huge. We, we need to continue that. We have a huge impact on all those businesses. Yeah. And I think 10 years ago, probably downtown and the surrounding areas weren't really ready to support something like that just because of the population. Now it's in such a different place. We're growing up, right? Yeah. We, we yeah. have a lot of uh, single family housing. We have condos, we have apartments, and we have ASU and U of A downtown. It's a great place to have a ballpark and it's only yeah. going to get better. So let's, let's talk about that because obviously you don't live in an economic bubble. Right. There's an impact to the the to what the Diamondbacks do here, not just game day, but everything else, salaries, all the expenditures. What's the economic impact that the Diamondbacks? Yeah, have? It, it's you know they're big numbers, and you have them in buckets. So, I mean, I look alone at at the original investment, which I think was 238 million from taxpayers, and then we put roughly the same in, not at the time, but we have yeah. since. Um, it, it's been like a for every dollar that taxpayers put in. 26, 28 years ago, it's been a return over $22. So I think it's $22.50 for every dollar. Um, so at the time, you look at a $238 million investment, it's well over $800 million now. And, and you look at the, the taxes that we're able to generate. This past year, sales tax alone for county, city, state was $25 million. And we're able to do so much more now because we now book the building, which has really helped. So that's yeah. why the concerts you referred to, whether it's Billy Joel or Elton John, the country concerts, the the bowl games, all of that the is Stones, generated. Which I'm going to be going to. There you go. Yep. Now, yep. So all of this is good, and, and I'm just I'm really proud of that. You look at uh, the World Series alone, not yeah. just the World Series, the playoffs. This year was 107 million dollars for state GDP just from the playoffs. Yeah. You know, the World Baseball Classic that was 10 games in five days. That was seven million dollars when we had the All Star Game in 2011. That was 60 to $70 million. So there's huge impact from having a baseball team. And on it's, a yearly it's, it's basis. an anchor on a, on a yearly yeah. basis. I always think about these things in terms of what if it wasn't here? So right. what would be the what would be the loss on a yearly basis or the the unrealized gains that you wouldn't get on a yearly That's basis? Right. And it's pretty significant. It, w- it is significant. Or what would we do as a community if we didn't have a baseball team to try and attract one? Right. Yeah. If we had never had yeah. one, we'd say we want one of those. You know, so and what we, we would do? And, we, and we would. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. But and then and then to your point about the community, too. 
regardless of how we play, we know we're not always going to win. We know we're not always going to have great seasons, but we know we're going to get back to the community. We're at over $80 million now that we've given back. Um, we're, it, it's all time highs. We've given back more to the community than all of the other local professional sports teams combined. And so that's our biggest point of pride. We understand our social impact. We understand our social responsibility. Um, and it, it starts at the top our, and our players are all involved. Our coaches are involved. Our front office is involved. Give something every day if you can. Yeah. Well, and I think you, you all are maybe a little too humble about that because a lot of people that aren't sort of in these circles don't know it. Well, yeah, and that. it's and, and you don't do it you right. know, to I pat know. yourself on the back. So I appreciate but you saying true. that. But it is true. But it is, and and we're all we're all involved in one way or another. Everybody in the organization, and we we give people time off to go volunteer, yeah. and give them time off to go, you know, work at a, a you know a food pantry, go to St. Mary's, go to St. Vincent, um, give something. That's the message. Give something. Well, I wanted to talk about the World Series, but as I speak about that, let's talk about that impact, the economic impact that the World Series had. I mean, what an incredible time frame for us here in Arizona. It was amazing. And, you know, we, we look back to our season, we sort of backed into it. I was thinking, if you asked me a year ago, Todd, are you guys going to be in the playoffs? I'd say, oh, I hope. You know, these are very young players. I hope so. This year, if we don't make it, I'd be disappointed because mm -hmm. we did get as far as we did. We barely made it in the playoffs, and then we just got hot. And I remember thinking, okay, we have to go to Milwaukee. We're going to have to face Burns and Peralta. That's going to be tough. We'll probably get swept, but what great experience for these young kids, and we sweep them. Well, now we got to go to L.A., and we know the Dodgers crush us anytime we play them, but it's still going to be great experience. And we didn't only beat the Dodgers. You know, we, oh, we walloped them to the point where felt we felt so good. It did. But we poked the bear, right? And they spent a billion dollars on two players in a week. Like, we'll show you, little guys. Um, and, and then we, you know, had to go play Philadelphia, which is unbelievable to have to go there and win game six and seven, which we did. So now you come back and you're playing Texas. And, and I can't compliment the Rangers enough for just how good of hosts they were and how great we all got along. All their yeah. fans, they were just classy as could be. And I congratulate them. But those five games were still magical. And we've, of course, played three and four and five here. And I thought if we could have gotten back, it would have been amazing. Um, but the energy and the support that we felt and yeah. saw throughout the state, that last month where we were battling with the Cubs and the Reds and the Marlins and, you know, are we going to get in? Are we not? And we, and, and we do. But it was unlike I've ever seen the state rally behind a team like, Oh one, sure. You know, and Oh seven and 11 and 17 were special times. Oh one, of course, but this was unbelievable. And, and the, the, the crowd was as loud as I've ever heard. And that Dodger series, when we hit yeah. back to back to back to back home runs, those four home runs. I must have just been so chilly. It was crazy. Yeah. And, and it was Gabby Moreno that hit the fourth one. And he hits the home run. The place erupts. And I'm screaming, go, this is the loudest I've ever heard this place. And then the umpires get together and they say foul ball. And we all went, oh. And we said, that would have been so cool. <laughs> he gets back up to bat. The first pitch hits it out. Yeah. So he still hit it out. And it got just, even louder. That must have been it so It was incredible. great. But, but World Series pride. I mean, to see see everyone wearing shirts around town and World Series gear and, mm -hmm. and just, you, you, I get chills because that's where you want to be. And when I was holding that trophy in, in Philadelphia on stage and the fans were still booing us and I'm holding that trophy <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, this is all you work for, right? For your fans to, and your employees to be able yeah. to get, get to the big fall classic. And we go back to the hotel before we're going to, we had to go to Texas, but before we go to Texas, we go back to the hotel in Philadelphia and I had my wife and one of our adult kids with us and a bunch of folks from, from our leadership team. And as we pull up, we're going to have this big party in the ballroom. And I get out and I told my wife and, and son, I said, you guys go ahead. I'm going to be right there. And I go up to my room and Todd, I open up the door in the dark. I sit down on the couch and I just start bawling. Yeah. You know, I, it I is, it's totally amazing. That. Yeah, it's and amazing. it must have been the next morning waking up and realizing wow. what happened. Yeah. Wow. Right. Well, did we really just win game yeah. six and seven? And now we're going to go to Texas and play in the World Series. It is so cool. And then you've got, of course, all your media there and they're beaming, right? You yeah. see these guys every day and you know who they are, but now they're traveling with you and they just felt like a part of the family. And they, deep down, they, they have to be, you know, they have to be credible you know, broadcasters and reporters, but deep down, they're like, this is our team. We want to win too. It was, it was very special. Yeah. I, I think for us too. And by the way, tested some marriages. My, my wife, but she got a ticket and I'm like, well, where, where's mine? And you're on your own. Yeah, yeah, like, so are good. you serious? That's so good. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, love it. I think everybody I just want, wanted to be there. Um, so a couple other things. You, you mentioned how baseball has changed and the rules changed. What thinking about the next 10 years, what else, what else can we expect? 
Yeah, I think the game is going to continue to progress. I mean, first off, you, you've got to attract the younger audience. And, you know, they have so much competition and it's all about access to the game. It's you see the models already changing. We used to have our regional sports networks were the biggest deal. We were on yeah. Fox Sports Arizona and then we were on Bally's Arizona. Well, that went away. Now we're still regional sports of our own with Major League Baseball. The way we view the game in the future is going to change. It's going to be about watching anywhere you go on your on your handheld or on your phone. Mm-hmm. Kids are going to be able to watch streaming. That's where we're going. Is there the kind of revenue that, that you had in the past with, with linear TV? Not at all, but that's mm-hmm. okay. We want people to be able to get your games, watch your games, become fans for life. Uh, I think technology is always going to change as well. You're going to have more technology in ballparks. You're going to have AI. You're yeah. going to have you know, eye or facial recognition as your ticket to get into a ballpark. The way you're going to order your food, the way you're going to consume the game, the, ga- the sports betting and gambling is already so different You know, yeah. on your handhelds in the game. It's changed the game, and it's kept people really attached, whether it's 10 to 9 nothing or one to nothing. And uh, I think, you know, from a rule standpoint, you're going to continue to see changes because we are sampling and testing all those at the minor league level. Automatic ball strike zone. If mm-hmm. you have the technology, why wouldn't you get it right? Right. And it's going to happen. True. You'll yeah. still have an umpire there because yeah. he or she has to make sure that the play at the plate was called. Correct. But you're going to get the technology on your side. And they're also sampling and testing right now at the minor league level challenges. It's almost like the tennis challenges right. where I thought that was out. Let's look real quick. Doesn't take a lot of time. Boom. That was yeah. a ball. You know, right. get back and in people the People feel like ball. I. I know for sure yeah. where things were. Absolutely. So yeah. those, those are the changes. And I think you're going to see changes to the CBA. Hopefully we're going to have labor peace, right? Yeah. And and you're going to, you know, I think it's good for the game in lots of ways. But um, I think you'll see expansion one day too, where we may have a couple more more teams and cities that are viable right now. You see cities like Salt Lake City mm-hmm. are ready to go. They just got legislation just just passed for $900 million towards a new baseball stadium. You know, Mexico City's always wanted a team. Nashville wants a team. Charlotte wants a team. That's good for the game if we can expand. It is good. And you you mentioned Mexico City. I mean, this is truly a world game now. World game. It is, um, you know, between soccer and baseball, they've always been really the most popular. If you go to Asia, it's baseball. You go to Japan and watch a game there. The energy, the noisemakers, the the loyalty to their teams, the bands they take on the road, it's amazing. Mexico is that way. Dominican Republic is that way. Venezuela. Um, so, so we have to continue to grow the game worldwide, and we've done that with the WBC a little bit. The Olympics, we'll see if we yeah. participate in the Olympics. Um, but, but yeah, Mexico City, we were going to play there. And, you know, it, it we were going to play... Oh, boy, we went and saw AMLO. We went to his palace mm-hmm. and got to meet with the president. He was excited. We were excited. We took a tour of the stadium, and then the plug was pulled. So I can't wait to get back in the queue there, which we will, to go play in Mexico City and represent us and take folks like you so yeah. you can shake hands and tell them why <laughs> Phoenix is such a great place. Well, one of the things I like about your international work that people don't know about um, is what you do in the DR, in the Dominican Republic, where, where you're scouting kids. And like most clubs, you you make sure that they're getting an education. The difference, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is a kid that doesn't make it all the way through, your commitment to them is they're going to get all the way through high school. You're exactly right. And it's really unique. And we're proud of that. And it's yeah. worked. And even if we if we cut a kid or if he, he quits and doesn't uh, want to play baseball anymore, we are still committed to him. He's got that laptop. He's got our curriculum. He's still going to graduate. And when they leave the, the academy at the Dominican because they get to come here and play for one of our affiliates – the program goes with them. So they continue to study and they're going to continue to get their graduation and get their, uh, the, their diploma. And it's worked well. And it's, it's, there's nothing like going to the Academy and seeing yeah. a kid that may be 24 years old and just got his high school diploma, you know, or yeah. someone that is 17 years old and, and just sped right along. And for them to say, thank you. Um, because we have to tell them not everybody's going to make it in baseball. Most don't. So yeah. if you're not going to be a scout or a coach one day or playing one day, we want you to be a banker or a doctor yeah. or own your own business or or be a chef. And you need your degree. And they they buy in. Well, and I, and I know that's not common. And I hope the other clubs are looking at your example and doing it because it's such a game changer. We've had a lot of teams ask us how and, and ask for the playbook, which is great because yeah. I, I hope every team and every academy does it eventually. You bet. Yeah. Well, let me switch gears a little bit. Pro State Foundation. Yeah. You talked a little bit about that. Obviously, you have a very strong connection to that. And you've been, you, you're you founded it. Yeah. So in 2011, uh, at the time I was well, 42 years old and it, by accident, I had blood work done that showed that I had prostate cancer. 
and uh, had my prostate removed and I'm very fortunate that I'm doing okay today. Uh, my wife as well, uh, a few years back had triple yeah. negative breast cancer, which was very scary. And it's been in the rear view, which is good. Uh, obviously it's good. Yeah. And, but prostate, I'm just, you know, what I found over time was if you could just talk to a man, men are scared to go to doctors. They don't want to, it. or they're too manly. Don't right? want to know. I know, I know, <laughs> I get it. But if they just go and, and so many guys just, can you tell me your story? And so for me to be yeah. again, transparent and just open up through our, our website and, you know, it's uh, it's saved. It has saved lives, which is which is yeah. wonderful. And today is so much different than it was ten years ago. You're yeah. talking about how quickly things change. Correct, again, Todd. Medicine it yeah. changes, and the options that people can go through. And so there's a lot of alternatives. And uh, I'm just trying to educate people and drive awareness. Well, and to think about if you hadn't done it, like yeah. if you hadn't made the call and gone in. Oh my uh, goodness, what's it different? We're, we wouldn't. I, we wouldn't be here. Right? We wouldn't be having this conversation. And for no other doubt. men to take that example and the example of your wife and to say, well, you would go get checked out. Exactly, it makes such a difference. Yep. Um, um, well, well, as we're wrapping up, I want to, I want to, I'm going to throw a date out at you okay. in Spanish. Tres de Mayo. Yes. Tell me, tell us the th th third of May. It's, yes. it's an important date for you, but it's, what does it mean? It's, a, it's an important one for me. That was, uh, that was the day that my wife and I were married. Mm -hmm. And so May 3rd, 1992 and Tres de Mayo, we actually went to, um, we went on a, a trip to Argentina and we visited a winery and we had an opportunity to, to buy a little acre there and have our own. So we actually bought a winery at the time. We <laughs> named it Trace de Mayo and our label, which is beautiful, was a, a waterfall because we got married in, at, uh, in Tucson at La Paloma oh, nice. in front of the waterfall. So we have this waterfall and we have the backs of our kids heads. So it's, it's two boys and our daughter and that's Trace de Mayo. So it's meant a lot to us. And uh, 3rd of May is a, is a day that's very special to me. We're a close family. We're, we're a great uh, husband and wife team. And, and I'm proud of where we've gone as a family. Well, and, and, and the pride certainly shows. Yeah, thank you. Well, one, I want to thank you for spending so much time with us and for everything you do in our community. We're going to do a quick lightning round here. Okay. Uh, first job. My first job was at uh, a newspaper, and I was actually... It wasn't delivering paper, but I was more of going to pick up ads and and uh, to go pick them up at agencies and take it back to the newspaper. Okay. And what yeah. did you learn? Um, I learned that I wasn't a very good driver of a truck and, <laughs> uh, and that I, you know, I did get in an accident. But I also learned that uh, my father, who was in the newspaper business, uh, worked really hard. I was able to observe him and yeah. then went off and did a few uh, jobs on my own. There was one time I had three jobs. I worked at a video store. It was a, like blockbuster. a blockbuster video. Oh, yeah. It was blockbuster and uh, a fitness center at the same time and a uh, monthly magazine. And I was doing all that, trying to figure out how to get into grad school so I could get into sports. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So obviously a lot of learning there. Yes. Okay. First car. First car was a Dodge Dart. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Dodge Dart. Nice That's one, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was brown. <laughs> yeah. so Pick you, your dates up in that you car. You were popular. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. And usually I, when I ask this question, this is what I say. So Derek Hall calls you and says, we're going to put you in the lineup. What would be your walk-up song? Clearly, you are Derek Hall. Yeah. What's your walk-up song? Well, my favorite song is Earth, Wind & Fire, uh, September. So I would have to go with it. Do that you is remember? The, yeah. That's it, actually the right answer. Oh, it's a great song. <laughs> <laughs> Derek, thank you. Thank you, Appreciate Todd. Appreciate all Thanks the time for having you take. Me. Yeah, sorry I spoke so much. No, it was great. We appreciate it. Thank you very much.